Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our coverage of HFES 2018. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined by Blake Arnsdorf, and we're also joined today by Peter and Gabby Hancock. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for having us. So this will be an interesting one because we didn't really have a topic that, you know, it's just this is going to be very stream of consciousness. Wherever the conversation goes, it goes. So I just want to kind of get to know you guys. What what can you tell us kind of about your research areas and, and history? Sure. I'm a professor at uh, the uh, National Football Champion, University of Central Florida, go Knights, <laughs> currently running at 17 and 0. Uh, I work in the Department of Psychology, but I also have an um, appointment in a place called the Institute of, Hu- of uh, Simulation and Training. So um, uh, I have a great time. We have uh, about 66,000 students, and I run a lab with about 60 total people, uh, about uh, three postdocs. Um, uh, about uh, 12 uh, doctoral students and then the rest are undergrads. Great. And how about yourself? Uh, so I'm Gabby Hancock. I'm an assistant professor of human factors and hum- com- human computer interaction at Cal State Long Beach. Go Beach. Go Wave. <laughs> and um, I uh, direct the Stress and Technology Applied Research Laboratory, and I have two graduate students and about 22 undergraduate research helpers. Great. So um, I don't know. Do we have any topics that we just are dying to? jump into you mentioned robotics and sure. AI and that's all yeah so so one that uh, has been um, humming around the uh, conference right now is this um, idea of automation and autonomy so uh, as we talk into the microphone here we're we're really looking at quite uh, complex technological systems but they're they're basically automated so you're doing some control but not much the autonomy systems are those that are going to be much more self-directed and i think that's a big topic for human factors is looking at what is the role of human beings when the machine is doing almost all of the work and gradually does more and more. So robotics, we like to think of as a sort of um, a physical instantiation of that. You see the robot. Robots can be different shapes. um, And if it's an android, it's a human shape. And we deal a lot with um, do people trust robots, uh, particularly been working for for the U.S. Army asking questions about what is it about the robot that would make you trust it or distrust it. So a lot of my students do work like that, um, but we also do a lot of work traditionally on stress and performance. We like to look at um, people under extremes, uh, and I mean extremes when when, uh, momentary decisions can mean difference between life and death. And so we do a lot of work on that, again, for the military, but also for a bunch of other people uh, who come and support our lab. So... um, Uh, We're starting some work, I hope, touch wood for a bit of the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Um, uh, We've got some ongoing uh, talks with them. So those are the sort of things my students do. Um, I do a lot of research on time, um, the dimension of time. Yeah, can we get into that really quick? Because that was a really interesting thing that you brought up before, is that that, uh, time does not exist? Time doesn't exist, yeah. It's... um, it's really hard to take that in because um, didn't we just start a few minutes ago and isn't it now and aren't we going to go into the future? So it seems so apparent to human beings that um, that it's almost impossible to wrap your mind around and go, well, no, actually the thing that was me, um, what seemed to be in the past and now seems to be me still at this present time is actually just two iterations of things that are connected, in this case, by consciousness. So if you want to go deep into it, it's fun. It's, it's great fun stuff. So um, you, you start off um, w- with something very, very low level. So if you think of any cell, any living cell, it sort of closes the loop and you've got an inside and an outside. And that becomes real important because that cell has now got to know not to eat itself. It's not going to survive if it does. So it has to have a, just a general idea of low level of identity. Now, it's, it's not consciousness in any ways, but human beings retain that, and it's very deep in the brain. And so the idea, the first idea is I am me. I am always me. I get up in the morning. I meet me again. I look in the mirror. That's me. So you get this constant line of progress. Now, on top of that, you throw the next level of the brain, and that is the way in which you coordinate things, right? So I'm going to walk around here. I'm going to avoid hitting the walls and whatever. And so that's the last part. And so the interesting thing is that 
What do you do if you're nature right then, right? Now you can go faster, you can be uh, Serena Williams and go quicker, or you know you can be Tiger Woods and be more accurate, but there's a limit to that. So for example, if I was to take your reaction time here, it'd be about 130 milliseconds. But if I go into the ocean, there are some jellyfish with reaction times of four milliseconds. Hey, wow. you lose, you lose immediately, right? So what has nature done with human beings and why are we doing the podcast and not the jellyfish? After all, they're much faster than us, right? So we've grown something in the top of our brain which allows us to see a future, right? It's, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's largely part of the prefrontal cortex and it's to do with planning. So right now as you're sitting here, you're probably thinking like me, what am I going to have for dinner? You know, am I ever going to get rid of my <laughs> wife? All those things you do in the future. And it's the, it happens all in, um, almost completely in the part of the brain that has just grown like a tumor. So. If you look at a crocodile brain over 100 million years, it's flatlined. It's very, very good at surviving where it is, but it's flatlined. But if you look at the human brain, it's grown quick. But if you look at the frontal cortex compared with everything else, it rockets up like that. And so what the frontal cortex does is it allows you to create the illusion of a past, present and future, which is so overwhelmingly useful to you that you would just never chuck it out the door. Why would you? It enables you to survive. And so when you come up to somebody and say, well, the time doesn't exist, they go, well, you must be crazy. And if you want to survive in this world, you are crazy because that's the framework you get, right? So three nice spatial dimensions, one temporal dimension, and we're all hunky-dory because we can all find the bar at the end of the day, right? But if, if that's not actually true, it recasts the whole way you start thinking about human beings. And then you have to think about that in relation to what do we do with technology, right? Technology is all about predicting the future. Technology is about the future. So one last thing on that before I let, um, I let the daughter jump in. <laughs> so if you think of all the research that people do in memory, right? Memory research is all about what do I remember of the past? So if you did all the old memory research, you used to have a sort of tray full of things and you would say, what do you remember on the tray? You would cover it up. And so everything in memory for maybe a hundred years has been about the past, okay? But nature doesn't care about your past. Memory is not for the past. Memory is for planning things better in the future. And so there's a big move in memory research, something called prospective memory. And if you start to think about that, then what you start to do is you ask about time itself. Now, uh, interestingly, I can, we can segue into the daughter here. So I wrote an article that sort of sat around for a long time. See how, see how <laughs> language has time right in there? And it's called On the Design of Time. So I published it in the Ergonomics in Design, which is the, one of the publications of the Human Factor Society. And they were nice enough to have respondents and one of the respondents, one of the acerbic respondents, one of the critics of my position, happened to be the fruit of my own loins, my child <laughs> here. Can you believe it? Sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child who turns out <laughs> to be a scientist. And so uh, I'll let her jump in because she was taking um, issue with a lot of the things that I was talking about in terms of design. Well, I'll start off with something I liked about it. Will that be okay? Oh, that's okay. great. That's great. Okay. What was that? The first words? Well, the his he gives a historical tour about our conception of time. And it is incredibly socially constructed, right? If you pull anyone off the street and say, well, how many seconds are there in a minute? You'll get a ready answer of 60. But says who? Who decided that? 60 is right. a fairly arbitrary number. So how did we decide to parse it into the units that we use every day? and that we agree on and that we find useful for science and practicalities, right, to be on time with, with others. Hang on a second. You remember Battlestar Galactica used to have centons <laughs> and there were a hundred of them instead of 60? Do you want to talk about the origins itself? If you would like to. Oh, so uh, it, it turns out that it go, that goes back almost almost to the origins of um, recorded human history because uh, people in the um, in the Middle East and particularly in the the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates had a um, a 60 counting system and so that's that's very old as far as human beings are concerned 
And so a lot of things are built on that, like why seven days in a week? Uh, you know, right. why, why, does, why, why do we have a weekend? I mean, you know, the days of the week are named after different um, cultures, different um, religious deities. And so it's all a mishmash as it comes through. And um, you say to yourself, well, why don't we work for three days and then we'll have the next four called the weekend. That'd be nice. And the French call it now le weekend, right? So they, they get annoyed because it's not a French word. But the, but the point is that those ways of counting time are arbitrary. But what I tried to get at in that article is that there's a deeper level, which is designing time itself. But it's very, very hard because there's lots of things in your body that are frequency locked. So it's five o'clock in the afternoon right now. That's that's pretty good. But if we start holding this particular meeting at four o'clock in the morning, we're all going to be dragging a little bit. And so you have what are called circadian rhythms, circa, meaning about, DAs, meaning a day. They don't last exactly 24 hours. But boy, if you get on a plane and travel over the Pacific Ocean, you pretty soon know that you've got an intrinsic rhythm and it's gone out of whack now for a while. So sure. you, you see that in yourself and you have brain rhythms as well. And the daughter's pretty good on the physiology and the brain rhythms. Maybe you want yeah, to talk about that? Absolutely. So, um, you know, you're, what I like to say is you're never as conscious as you think you are and you're never as unconscious as you think you are, right? So even if you're asleep, you're, you're semi-aware of the passage of time. You wake up, you don't know how much has passed, but you're aware that time has passed right or hopefully and then that kind of expectation gets violated when you go under general anesthetic which is why it's so disorienting but that um, at least sensation or at least that intuitive feeling of the passage of time is actually biologically based and it's called intracellular ticking and basically it is the amount of time uh, forgive me for using such an inaccurate term but the time (laughs) that it takes for any particular cell in your body to generate a particular protein for it to degrade and then for a new one to be made so what it takes for that one cycle your body knows time has passed can i jump in and ask a question so earlier today there was a panel on school safety and uh tammy griffith gave the example of in in her simulation there was uh, an educator who thought that no time had passed uh when when they were responding to a situation. Can you kind of talk about the intersect between what's happening there and perception of time? Oh, yeah, oh, we can do that. forever and a day. <laughs> uh, okay. Can I take this one first? Uh, you, Just because it marries your perspective uh, memory that you talked all about. All right, before. you go first. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about, because uh, one of our interests, of course, is the extremes of stress, right? And so you'll find that in a lot of instances where the body is at risk, right? You hear people who have almost drowned or people who have been attacked by sharks who say, my life has flashed before my eyes. That's not too inaccurate a description of what is actually happening. The electrical signals in your brain fire so quickly, and what has happened is your brain is searching through the entirety of your memory, saying, when have I ever encountered an instance similar to this before? What did I do to get myself out of it so that I can save myself from this particular dangerous situation? So um, there's a lot of really fun anecdotal evidence for that. Watch Shark Week. Uh, It's very interesting. Um, CSULB, by the way, has one of the most famous shark labs in the world, so they're always interviewing us out there. Oh, I see you're doing the advertising here. All right, so uh, we have a, uh, I have a paper called um, a Time Distortion Under Stress, uh, largely sponsored by the military, but um, it, it's a hard area to investigate because you're not, uh, because of the, the Human Subjects Board, you can't put people under those levels of stress, but it clearly happens um, on, on many occasions. And one of the interesting things is you can sort of begin to map what happens in the brain. Now, you remember I talked about the frontal cortex being sort of the planning of the future? The frontal cortex shuts down. So if I were to shoot Blake here, he's a pretty good target, and if I boom like this, okay, his <laughs> body does wonderful things to keep him alive, right? It will do marvelous things. It will shut off a lot of peripheral systems. He'll sort of go a little bit cold in the extreme limbs because it's saving up all the blood to actually repair what's going on there. So when I attack him, he, he, he's not aware of those. He doesn't sort of plan it going, hey, quick lads, back to a survival mode here. But <laughs> bas- basically, that will all happen without him thinking about it. So in the time distortion and distress you're not turning it off i mean that's a sort of um that's a little bit of a a, a sort of way that that they like to generalize about these things but what you're doing is you're minimizing uh the frontal cortex because you you're not planning for a future you might not have and so what happens is that um a lot of the ways you calibrate time are now interrupted and disrupted 
So um, uh, you, you can see it in various ways. So there's a, a really great guy who did research on this. Um, I, I, I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about uh, Langer, Wapner and Werner. Those are fun guys. And there's another guy I'll talk about first, David Engelman. So Engelman um, uh, was interested in this um, uh, phenomenon. And so uh, what he did was to uh, drop people backwards off of one of those big towers that you get at the, uh, at the amusement park, uh, about okay. 180 yeah. feet high. And they actually had to try and spot certain cues as they went down, screaming, I assume. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, lie in there in the head of the thing and down. Down you go, and so he did some real interesting work on that. But the um, the one I love is the, is the old time stuff. It's about 1958 by three guys called Langer, Wapner, and Werner. So the experiment runs like this. It's just a great experiment. So the subject, this, remember this is 1950s, but the subject comes up the stairway to the experimental room, and as he comes up, a wheelchair comes bouncing down, and he hears the experimenter uh, letting off, sounding off a few uh, expletives and whatever. And then they put him upstairs and then they put him in the wheelchair and then they blindfold him. And then either wheelchair is moved towards, in this case, the stairwell where he's already <laughs> seen it bounce down. <laughs> and then they have the control condition, which is it goes the same distance in the other direction where there's no, where there's no stairwell. So it's a perfect experiment because the time that it takes in each direction is the same. He sat in exactly the same condition, but, but everybody thinks time is distorted tremendously <laughs> when they're going towards the stairwell. And, and they're sort of like, oh, this doesn't matter if I'm going towards the wall, I don't care. <laughs> it's something won't be a trouble. So uh, it, there's some great experiments in there, but um, a lot of the stuff you pick up is from people who've been in um, who, people who've been in these situations. Now it has an interesting sequelae, Nick, which um, which I can bring in, and maybe that can segue us to somewhere else. So uh, it, it always there's always a, a, a sort of funny side, but a tragic side. So. Um, I uh, do uh, forensic expert witness work, and this is one area that's come up two or three times where people have um, been involved in a car accident. Unfortunately, they've died. And what the lawyer wants to know is, does the expansion of time that happens during that interval uh, mean that they experience greater pain and suffering, which is a legal issue. The more pain and suffering you experience, the more presumably that uh, the other side is culpable for. Sure. So I do, uh, I've done a couple of things like that, which are very, very difficult because there's no great normative data to look at. Uh, and so you're working from at the very edge of what we can actually explore. So Watson Sharrock, the other Watson Sharrock one, which is a good one, is uh, they brought in people who were scared of spiders, and they, they brought the spider closer and closer. And as the spider, it's under a bell jar, they're not that bad, but it's not a tarantula, but as the spider gets closer, people think the same amount of time is, is much longer because they're in fear of danger, right? So Gabby's right, it's a, it's a defense mechanism. It happens, it happens quite regularly. Uh, people get very... Um, it's very disturbing when it happens. It happened to me. I was involved with my wife in a, um, in a car accident, but the first time it happened to me, uh, you can even see the detritus of it. There it is. I, I ripped a finger. I was on a, um, a bicycle in England, and I was coming down a roadway, and unfortunately somebody came out across me, and uh, I went across the top of the hood. And as I flew through the sky, as I can still remember now, I remember thinking to myself and saying at this rate, this is going to hurt. <laughs> and sure. it was it was that rate that I was saying it, which is about, you know, two or three seconds maybe, but it's a it's a second before I hit the ground. But for me, time is going like, whoa, what are we gonna do? So um, it just shows as as Gabby's sort of saying is that consciousness is not all we think it is. You know, we open up um, I think some of the great work that's been done in the last 20, 30 years that human factors is beginning to catch up with is is the idea of implicit processing, processing that's non-conscious which goes on all the time that keeps you going. Sure. Did you have something to add to that, Blake? So I wanted to <laughs> actually go back to you, Gabby, because you were talking about that there was a bit of a different like opinion you had on how time moved from uh, Peter. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yes. So, um, uh, so he likes to say that time doesn't exist for various metaphysical reasons that he'll no doubt chime in on. 
But um, I like to argue from the physiology side, because I've been trained as a physiologist, that the experience of time can be rooted in this physiological process, whether that is conscious or unconscious and can be used to a particular effect is arguable. But time would necessarily have to be passing in that building and degradation process that the body and all organic life does. Well, that's a good try, of course, but there's a but <laughs> on that. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> it, if I were to try to explain to you why language doesn't exist using language, you would sort of look at me sideways and go, but, 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 but you're talking to say this doesn't exist that you're talking. It can't be done. It's sort of nonsense on his face. And so what Gab is doing there in some senses is using frequencies using events that happen in time to say that time must exist and that's where the big argument comes up between myself and, uh, and and Gabby and other people as well is that it's very difficult to conceive of those things that seem to happen so regularly as though there could not be time now her argument which was a good argument was well what about the dinosaurs so if time is a human construction Presumably our friendly dinosaurs were there a few million years before human beings, didn't they? Didn't they chew the cud? Weren't they out there wandering in the park, enjoying themselves? Uh, meeting, es escaping from zoos. Meeting you know. Richard Attenborough, all those <laughs> other things that people like to do. And, um, and so that's an interesting argument because it comes down to um, something between what's called t time, uh, the dimension of time and the idea of duration. So that becomes a very um, convoluted argument we're not going to go into here, but it's sort of like um, uh, saying, in effect, we have many, many ways to express space, but we only seem to have one very rigid way to express time. So, um, uh, but uh, we should move on to human factors well, things. So, well, actually, we're almost out of time, but I... We are? No. Yeah, I, I knew we were. I knew we were. I told you. I believe it. I do want to touch on one thing before we go, though. When I asked you if you wanted to plug any of your stuff, you were... You, you brought up this the conversation. Can yeah, you just yeah. kind of briefly go over what that is? And yeah, yeah, our listeners can sure, find it. sure. I think this is an important thing because um, I, I, it, it just affects everybody in science and beyond. Um, so there's, there's very little doubt. I don't think you get any argument. The fact that science is a critical way in which we uh, begin our conceptions and realities of technology. And I don't think you get too much argument with people that technology is... Um, one of the most powerful forces that affect us on our planet. Uh, technology we're looking at right now. I mean, I think I'm right in saying that pretty soon we'll go over more, more cell phones on planet Earth than there are people on planet Earth. And so one of the questions is, I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm sort of paid actually by the state of Florida and other people to be a scientist, so I do that, that's my job, but people really have a right to know what they're paying for. And so one of the great problems is that the scientist, his... his his nose is to the grindstone, he's doing his experiments, he's deep in the, the sort of the, the front leading edge. And a lot of scientists either don't or some can't take their work, express it and, and make it make sense for the guy in the street, frankly, who's paying the tax to do it. So we've got to bridge that gap. And now what um, the National Science Foundation did is, is they said, well, you know, we're faced with a lot of really difficult problems uh, but we need people to be aware of the of the nature of the problems in terms that they can follow understand if they're going to make good decisions right so it's no use just listening to purported people talk about you know standard error and um, and other um, sort of arcane language that scientists understand so what the NSF tried to do uh, is to promote um, scientific understanding by the public who who are interested in that now, the conversation is something I picked up there when I was at that conference, and they're just an online group that um, try to take a scientist and then they pair them with a, um, with a, a journalist, in my case, a real nice guy called Jeff Inglis, who I work with three or four times now, and he'll sort of say, look, you, you really can't say this. Uh, it, it's far too much out of, an e uh, out of a scientific journal. People, you're going to turn people off. So he, he makes sure that you put your ideas in a cogent, simple manner, simple sentences, which I'm not good at, you know, use of commas, which uh, I'm also not good at. Uh, but the nice thing as a scientist is I get to put in as many links as I like. So if I say something like, as I did about autonomous cars, is that, is that autonomous cars and pedestrians are going to have trouble understanding what they're going to do because they don't have the common ground that 
that human drivers have with pedestrians. You know, I step off as a pedestrian, right. the, the human driver might hit the horn or whatever. So we put things like that in there and it gets to a much larger range of people. Like, like this podcast. This podcast is important because hopefully a lot of people can, can chime in and go, oh, that's okay. And they might not believe what I say, but hopefully they'll have fun. And that's a good point. I, yeah, and I, I certainly had fun. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for being on the show and um, talking about time and, and the conversation and uh, everything. Thank you so much. We, we, uh, when we end this thing, we like to say it depends because in human fa- you both chuckle. And we've seen this across like all the other Everybody interviews. realizes it. Yeah. Everyone knows it depends. So... Like, say it depends to sign us off, so I'll count us down, we'll say it depends, and we'll get out of here, right? Before you say it depends, before you count us down, <laughs> I was asked to, um, among other people, enter a competition for a skeptic. So my my phrase is not it depends, my phrase is no doubt, K-N-O-W-D-O-U-B-T. No doubt, always ask yourself the question, no doubt. Can we say no doubt, it depends? We can. All right, nice. three, two, one. No, no doubt, doubt, it depends. depends.